I haven't been able to apologize to him face to face, which every year at a certain time I've been wanting to do, and in between as well. And so I carry that story with me, and I tell that story to my students. And I ask them to think about, for a few minutes, times when they have been victims, witnesses, or perpetrators of the kinds of things that make our memories painful. And this is how I end the first day of Holocaust Studies course at uh, Milpitas High School. And the students are as you are now, silent and thinking. They begin, and the journal has nothing to do with the Holocaust. The journal has to do with society and the individual, with the role that they play. And it has to do with what affects the choices that we make in our lives. And I would like to show that, uh, that to you a little bit, maybe get some feedback from you as well. I don't know if I can maneuver uh, with all these chords, but I'll give it my best shot. If I get tangled up in it, so be it. Um, it's a very difficult thing to introduce this material to students. It's dangerous territory. It's territory that they don't often become exposed to. And it's dangerous individually as well because you have to put yourself on the line to do these things with students. And you have to be a, I have to allow them to get to know me quite well. And I'm not always sure what they're going to do with that information. But we begin this way nonetheless. And the reason for that is because I want them to understand that the classroom must be a place where they can, and they can share some ideas that ordinarily they might not get an opportunity to share with other people. And the environment has to be the kind of environment in which they trust each other and in which they trust the teacher. So that's the way we begin. And the journals have rules to them. I, I, re I read them, but I don't put red marks on them. And I never circle spelling errors. And I never give A, B, C, D, F on their journal entries. The journal entries are graded only if they were there and they cared enough to attempt to put something down that was honest and real. And I write, I keep a dialogue with them, and I write back and forth with them but no grades. I may ask them questions, and I may pull them in and speak with them individually, but we don't grade them. The first section that we deal with in our Holocaust Studies course has nothing to do with the Holocaust. We don't even mention the Holocaust yet in this situation. They don't know where they're going with it at this point. We have all a choices paradigm. paradigm. Uh, there are some people in this audience who may not know what a paradigm is. I see some younger people there. And so I need to, I need to give, the, give uh, even though you may know, I need to give a background on that. A paradigm, I'd like to think of it as a framework through which to view something. Uh, a window through which we can view. A telescopic lens through which we can make things clearer for ourselves as we look at something important and difficult. A, a rubric, a measurement by which we, can, uh, which we can use to limit our discussion in some way. So this paradigm is a paradigm of choices. I want you to envision, and this is what I do with my students, I want you to envision a brick wall at the end of a long street. And that brick wall is there, and we all know it's there. And we're in a car going down this road, going 65 miles an hour. At this point, we're far away from the brick wall. There are turnarounds, off ramps, streets, places to pull in and get a bite to eat, a gas station perhaps, a few more side streets, maybe another turnaround, lots of options. And here, we have the option endlessly of how to do it. And why we have so many options is because we see what's in front of us. We can see what's there. Endless choices. We can stop. We can turn around. We can go back. We can pull in. We can pull out. We can make a left. We can make a right. When we get up to here, our choices have become more defined. Our choices have become more defined. <laughs> Mm 
because there are fewer of them and because we're closer to our eventual uh, end point. When we get here, and we're two feet away from the wall, and we're still going 65 miles an hour, we have what's called choiceless choices. Choiceless choices, is it choices? Perhaps uh, we can utter a quick prayer. Maybe it's intuitive. Maybe there's no room even for the words to come out before we slam into the wall. Uh, we can attempt to turn, minimize the impact. But at two feet and 65 miles an hour, uh, it's a choiceless choice. We can, go, we can still go left. We can still go right. We can think. But the choices are choiceless. And so before we ever begin a unit on the Holocaust, in my classes at the high school or in the work that I do with junior teachers, I like to have students consider the fact that their role in society is often determined by the types of choices that they possess. And that knowledge is power. Knowledge of choices is power. And that means that when they talk about Weimar Germany, and when they talk about the early years and the first stages of the Holocaust, 33 to 38, the isolating period, the psychologically isolating period, the period of time in which the rights of German citizens disappeared, were taken, were given up. They can see it in terms of the paradigm. They can see it in terms of how it led to choiceless choices for many people. Not in a way that condemns or condones, but in a way that makes them consider in a critical manner what may have occurred in the lives of individual people. We have them deal in their journals with moments of time in which they can place themselves on the paradigms. Because we want to internalize this idea for them. We want them to have, we want them to have some understanding of the fact that their role in society is sometimes conditioned on what kind of information they have and on what kind of choices they choose to make. And once they understand that this is the case, they're a little bit more ready take a look at a phenomenon in history such as Jew hatred, or a phenomenon in history that has one people victimizing another, a phenomenon in individual's history in which they have to make individual choices within a larger context about how to act, or where to go, or what to do, or what to believe, or what to accept. This is a very difficult charge. We are often accused, Holocaust educators, of psychological manipulation of students. There are people who believe that journals are a psychologically manipulative tool for teachers to use, and that we ought to stick to the three R's. But I believe, and I think most educators, people involved with any kind of ethical, moral, decision-making curricula would believe that paramount in this study is the idea of what kinds of choices people make at individual moments of their lives. And those decisions can be shaped by the kinds of paradigms they carry with them. Just like my conduct today, if I were to be drafted as a 39-year-old into the United States Army, a personal paradigm, an experiential paradigm to work through, I don't think, I don't think, I don't know, I don't think that I would deliver a kick to the ribs of a fellow human being. I hope I'm right. Uh, I think there are some historical precedents to suggest that under certain circumstances I may be wrong. But I hope I'm right and it gives you to think about and it gives kids something to think about. This paradigm also complicates history. It helps them complicate history because when we talk during Holocaust Studies program, and I'm not going to do this, this chronologically. I'm not going to walk you through what we do with kids in terms of 1933 to 1945. We're going to do it thematically. But when we talk about, for example, resistance to the Holocaust by Jews and by non-Jews, we can talk about it in terms of the choices paradigm. One of my favorite clips of um, a video is on a video called Courage to Care. How many of you have seen Courage to Care? Anyone? 
It's a wonderful 26-minute video. I recommend it to you and to your alliance, something that uh, uh, perhaps could eventually be shown. It's narrated by Elie Wiesel, um, which is only one of the things to recommend it to you. It's interviews with people who were either or who saved other people. And there's a wonderful segment on this video with a Dutch woman who tells her story something like this. She was asked uh, early on in the portion of, of uh, Dutch, um, the Dutch portion of this history, to shelter a Jewish family, a man and his three children. And she was a young woman, and the reason that she felt the strength, the reason she was able to make the choice to do that was because of what she had seen prior to this. At, at one point, she was walking down the street, and she saw Nazis aided by Dutch collaborators loading Jewish children into a truck to be taken off. And she saw it, and she couldn't do anything about it at that moment. She saw not only the children being loaded into the truck, but she saw two men run after these Nazis and begin to beat them with their umbrellas. And they were thrown into the truck along with the children that they had tried to defend. And she stood mute. And so she says, do not dare to call me a hero because I may have had a heroic moment, but I also had other moments. It deserves to be complicated for children, for adults, for all students of it. At one point on the paradigm, we can dis and we discuss this with our students, where she found herself on the paradigm in the first instance was here, because her choices were choiceless. If she chose to make the moral statement to be do the heroic, make the moment a heroic one for herself, she would inevitably be taken. And all the other potential heroic moments that were lurking inside her unknowingly, unwittingly, would have been squelched, would have been, would have been taken care of, would have been wiped away. But because she had, she had other kinds of choices. And so we ask students to consider paradigm of choice in terms not of the Holocaust, but in terms of what's gone in the last two weeks of their lives on their own high school campus. Have there been moments in their own social situations on the quad in the middle of the day? You know, you don't have to go back 40 years to see in humanity. You can see it on the schoolyard. You can see the insiders and outsiders in the classrooms. And if the history doesn't bounce back and forth, between what was and what is for them, then why, must, why do we teach it? Because the premise I began with was that there can be some difference made by giving them these paradigms. And why the Holocaust? It's a great question. I've been asked it many times. Why don't, why don't we study this instead of the Holocaust? It's a good question. Why don't we study uh, other aspects of inhumanity? Why always the Holocaust? Always the Holocaust. And there's some answers to that. First of all, and not by any means the only reason, we know so much at the same time as so little about it. We have a role as Americans. We have people among us who can give us more information. It is unique in specific ways. And in its uniqueness, we can learn universal lessons. It's unique in the idea, I believe. There are some scholars, I suppose, who dispute it. Some of them know in many when I. But this is where I am now in my study of the Holocaust after 10 years, not of primary research. I'm not a primary researcher. I'm a gatherer of information. I'm, I'm a, a sieve, <laughs> I hope through which some information passes, and a cataloger. And everything I give you here is tentative. It isn't, I haven't reached conclusions. And I'm not sure it's so good all the time to reach conclusions. 
but I believe it, it is unique in terms of the intentionality of the perpetrators, in terms of the number of resources, in terms of the single and, and, and single-mindedness of their vision, in terms of what they were willing to give up to pursue their racial policy and their goal, in terms of its inclusiveness in some ways and its exclusiveness in others. You know, the, uh, Jehovah's Witnesses were victims. Not in the same way, but victims. Poles were victims. Not in the same way or for the same reasons. And with a different end in sight. But within a philosophy of raci racial thinking that is in some ways very foreign to uh, our students today, but in some ways strikes some resonant chords. Witness what happened here in this county, I believe, isn't it? This Sonoma County, not too long with an Aryan Woodstock. And so there's resonance for them of these racial theories. But there is also uniqueness. Students are surprised to find out that the Nazis continued to pour money and uh, manpower into this dream that they had of annihilating Jews and enemies of the Reich and into the idea of resettlement and repopulation of certain areas and creating a modern feudal society with Poles and Slavs and other people as the workforces for Nordic Germanic Aryan overseers. They're surprised that it is a war within a war. They're surprised to find out that America had something to do with this, not just proximally, but in its genesis, the laws, the 2,000 or so Jewish ordinances and laws and rules that make up the isolating portion of the Holocaust, psychologically isolating as well as legally and otherwise, were in some ways modeled not just on ancient church law, and there's plenty of precedent to say that they were modeled in some ways on that. Raoul Hilbert writes about it very convincingly and gives a, a, uh, a very, a very uh, interesting list of the uh, canonical laws that were paralleled under, under Nazism. But also Mississippi and Louisiana Black Codes, which were lifted in some cases word for word into the idea of what the uh, first anti-Jewish ordinances were to include. So there is an intertwining of the history that students need to hear about. We talk in this man and society, society and the individual, not just about the choices that face these people, but about what the choices would have been, how would the choice work on this paradigm? Were they to have specific kinds of information that were denied to them? And we have them writing about such things to each other. And we have them sitting and talking and asking questions of each other and posing questions about the paradigm. So we've given them some kind of a framework through which to envision individual cases and scenarios. I'd like to stop just for a minute and, and, and pause and ask you um, whether the paradigm makes sense to you and, and what your reaction to the paradigm is. Uh, would anyone like to pose a question or a comment about it. It's tough to do. Yes, please. Uh, well, the first thing I thought of was is that the wall is not always visible to society. So that, that's an immediate problem for me. Um, the, for example, the environmental, uh, what's going to happen to the planet, that's a wall that people can even see. But there are others, like future wars, yeah. that are not apparent to most people. Yeah, I think there's a difference between knowledge and information. I think, for example, uh, toxic waste you know, uh, is a problem that uh, people have heard of, but they don't spend a huge amount of time thinking about nor acting on. And so is there a wall or that, that, that and what, how do you define visibility becomes a problem. I think that's a really interesting idea. And it's the same kind of question we get from students, uh, albeit uh, sometimes less sophisticatedly than, than might, might occur here. About, about us here, about this wall. Uh, we don't always know what the end result might be down the line. We don't always see it. It doesn't mean we don't know we're traveling down a, a road uh, that can lead to some kind of 
pain or disaster. That students do know. That they do know. Yes. Yeah, it's a really interesting question. Uh, I'll give you a conversation that I had two days ago with a group of students. We were talking not about this. This was long past uh, in, in what we had left behind. We were talking about college admissions. And uh, a girl came in the room who had made it known to everyone that she had applied to three specific universities and was planning on going to whichever one of them uh, admitted her. Well, she wasn't admitted to any of the three to which she applied. And this is a very bright young lady, but she is not a lady who goes home to a family who sits around the dinner table and talks about college admissions. Her understanding of what that means is limited to a very small peer group and maybe a few teachers who've pushed her to apply to college. So the options are not readily available to her. She doesn't know, she doesn't have a, a very wide base to work from. So we began to talk about that. She came in, somebody came in and said, Julie's going to come into class today. She's really upset, just so you know, which is what kids do. Uh, what do I do about that now? What's she upset about? Uh, and so the girl told me what Julie was upset about. I said, uh -huh. So we erased what we were doing on the board, and we put up, I put up the, the, the paradigm. And we started talking about college admissions. And uh, we started, I said, it's your job to arm yourselves through cooperative venture so that you have lots of choices available to you. How can we make sure that in terms of colleges, where we all stand on this paradigm is not here, but here? And so we started throwing out information to each other in the classroom. And I think at that point, the brick wall became very visible for them. And I think there's a way to do that, not just, and with any subject, not just the Holocaust. So that's why this unit is is a man in society, man uh, choice making, people in the world unit, not just Holocaust. But it's only a window in so that we can use it as we visual stories. I told the story about a woman named Gisela Pearl. Has anyone heard of her? Gisela Pearl was a doctor, a Hungarian born obstetrician who was sent to Auschwitz. And Dr. Mengele uh, appropriated her services to work in a very poor infirmary. And the only palliative she could offer to anyone was the spoken word. There were not uh, much in the way of uh, anesthetics or medicines that could allay their pain or their fears upon entering the infirmary. But she also took note of the number of women who would have been killed because of pregnancy and began to perform surreptitiously abortions in the concentration camp in Auschwitz. And when we tell that story, people, I, I open it up for the students to ask questions about her. What do you want to know about her? And the students ask questions that reflect their own world. We have in Milpitas uh, quite a group of students, very conservative, uh, sometimes evangelical or fundamentalist, depending on which word you feel most comfortable with, background. We have quite a few uh, one-room churches and fast food places in Milpitas. And I don't mean to uh, poison the well by that. It's a very nice place in many ways. Um, but this, there, are, there are students who've asked, didn't she have a conflict? You said she was a very religious woman. And so we have to deal with that idea. And we have to complicate history for these students. And we talk there, Gisela Pearl ends up on the choices paradigm. And we talk about how she maximized the use of her choices ethically, uh, physically, in terms of her actions, in terms of what she would or wouldn't do. And the students began to, began to raise questions of, what if the pregnancy was late? What if it was seven months along, but because of malnourishment or whatever, um, it hadn't been discovered? Did she do an abortion then? An interesting question. And if she did, how do you feel about that? And we discuss it in terms of the choices paradigm. And we complicate history. And we don't say, yes, it's moral, no, it's immoral. There's no room for that in this kind of a discussion. My god, how dare we complicate the thinking of adolescents to the point where we might not give them an answer that's black or white, yes or no, right or wrong. What a wonderful thing we do for them when we allow them to tolerate a little bit of ambiguity 
in their lives. And this is one of the main goals and one of the main objectives of this course, not just to teach the history. You see, it's not a matter of just teaching the history. If it were just a matter of teaching the history, I could do to them what I'm doing to you and just give it to them out loud one day after another. But it wouldn't work very well because they'd be so put off by the images of death and so put off by the images of horror and so convinced that it's an aberration in history because after all, it's like nothing they've ever seen, like nothing they'd ever want to see. Or, my goodness, I could just show them night and fog and say, see, this is why we study history, which some teachers do. And if I were to do that, it would be totally irresponsible. And so the objective isn't to test them on what happened in November of 1938 with Kristallnacht. It's not, that's not the objective. Or uh, on what day of, of the year uh, on, uh, what's Adolf Hitler's birthday? Or uh, what was the name of the, uh, the uh, uh, first law of the Nuremberg Laws? Not the kind of education we wish to give these students. They will go far beyond and pick up the specifics of the history in a developmentally correct manner as they encounter it but if we don't give them something to chew on, if we don't complicate their thinking, then we haven't done anything to them or for them. And some people do think it's psychologically manipulative. I, I believe that it's a matter of giving them a paradigm of choices that they have to consider and deal with. Okay, uh, what else comes to your mind about the paradigm? Anything? Please feel free. Uh, it's a, sort of a radical notion to teach the Holocaust without ever mentioning the Holocaust in the first week or so. Yeah. Uh, what are the parents' responses? It's a great question. Um, Mr. Kravis, is that, is that right? Mm -hmm. uh, told me a, a little short scenario that I've experienced a few times in the 11 years that I've been in Milpitas and the 16 years I've been teaching. Uh, and it's a scenario in which someone's re uh, objected to the curriculum. A Holocaust curriculum. Send home a book like Night or The Diary of Anne Frank. And what immediately comes to some people's minds, especially those perhaps of uh, Germanic parentage, is you're going, to, you're going to expose my children to this and they're going to come home and they're not going to be able to kiss their grandparents. When the grandparents come for their birthdays, they're going to say, where were you and what were you doing? We learned about this and you were there. It's a very difficult scenario, and I had that happen in Milpitas. And there were parents who called and said, I want my, they called not me, they called the principal, and said, I don't wish my daughter exposed to this material. The principal called me and said, can we shift her to another class? And I said, what? You need to come to my class and see the choices paradigm. You need to see that there are other things at stake here, and that we have more choices than a yes or a no, and let's explore them. And so parents and I made an appointment with them to come in, to meet with me privately. And we sat down and I showed them Elie Wiesel's book, Night. And we opened up the book, Night. How many of you have read Night? Amazing book, important book. Important in the sense for teaching that it hits kids right where they live. They are of the same age that Elie Wiesel was, was when he was taken to a concentration camp, to the death camp. Of Auschwitz. And they read a particular story. And we, we sometimes uh, uh, teach the history out of the story rather than telling the history and then reading the story. I opened up to the page in Night where Elie Wiesel talks about an uh, aid that he received from a German prisoner, not a German Jew, a German prisoner in Auschwitz. And we say, you see, we must separate times, German and Nazi. Because you know, Nazism can exist without Germanism. And how do we teach? Do not despair. We will teach this history with full recognition of the thousands of Germans who resisted or attempted to resist. It's not a very large number in comparison to their population, but perhaps all the more significant because it's a small number. We will talk about the people 
the approximately, as, and this is a, uh, a tentative number that I received from a, a primary source at Yad Vashem, 3,000 priests and ministers who went to their incarcerations or deaths in concentration and death camps due to fighting against the Third Reich. And these stories are important. We talk about, I have an Estonian girl in one of my classes. And her parents uh, monitor her materials very closely. Not for any other reason interested. But when they saw a knight come home, uh, they were curious. Because they've only been in this country about 11 years. And they were impacted by World War II history. And they're curious about what Americans do in teaching of this stuff subject matter. And uh, they wanted to make sure that uh, students were exposed to what occurred in Estonia and what occurred in other places uh, like Ukraine and Lithuania and Latvia. And how was that history taught? Is it, isn't it taught that not just the Germans were to be held up, that Nazism and Germanism are not always exactly synonymous, that the Ukrainian guards and the Lithuanian, Latvian, and sometimes Estonian paramilitary people participated. And this family had been impacted by that. And the grandparents had been, um, in what way I don't know, but according to these people, suffered in, in some respect during the war. And so we do have some parents calling. But what occurs is a conversation and an invitation to join us and to offer their perspective after I know what it is, um, because it's not always so safe to do. I had a young lady come uh, up to me and say, my mother was in the Hitler Youth. And this woman came and spoke about what it was like during uh, the early part of Hitler's rule and what it was like for her. Because prior to the rise of Hitler, five million German youth were in some kind of scouting or organized youth movement and it was so chaotic that there were many people holding on to something somehow and that in her case according to her her joining of the Hitler youth was not something ideological but something else she didn't even know how to and that it didn't have much to do in her case with Jews because she didn't know any Jews and how she feels very guilty, and how she, she told the story of how she first met me. She came and she sat down to meet me, and the first question she asked me was, what are you thinking? And I had to stop and think about that, because what I was thinking was, where were you, and what were you doing, and what does it mean that you're here next to me today at a table and that you may be speaking with my students? And I said to her, what are you thinking? She says, I'm very frightened. I'm very frightened. And so we established common human ground immediately. And the other story that I tell the students, and this, this happens, I tell the students and I told this, these parents this, this story. My mother contracted tuberculosis when I was seven years old. And she was sent to a sanita sanatorium, sanatorium, TB sanatorium, uh, called the City of Many of you may be involved even today in uh, uh, fundraising for City of Hope. My father was a teacher. Uh, he was a PE teacher, not a philosopher, uh, although a philosopher in his own right. And he worked at Hunt's Cannery at night. He worked there because he uh, had no choice. We had expenses to meet. He had to make extra money to pay for an, a nanny to take care of us. And the nanny who took care of us was named Mrs. Sobel. Mrs. came to our door, my mother, mother, who had come to visit us to stay the first few weeks that my mother was in the hospital, and then had to go back. She had a career and a family and deal with her own uh, in another state. My, my father and my grandmother interviewed a succession of women who came in to interview to take care of us. And at opportune moments, my sister and I, she was four and I was six and a half or seven, were trotted out to meet and interact with for a few minutes potential caregivers and then trottle off into the other room. And uh, we used to go into the front room and sneak 
by the curtains. We used to sneak and to see these women walking up the, uh, the driveway. And we would say, I like this one. I don't like this one. Uh, and a woman came up the driveway wearing very sensible shoes and a house dress that reminded me very much of my other grandmother. Very heavy woman, soft bosom to think of it because I used to lay my head on her chest uh, uh, and let her read me stories in her accent. And uh, she came up the walk, and we saw her, and my sister, who was only four, said, look, look, she looks like Grandma Cece. Yeah, yeah. She didn't even knock on the door. She saw the mezuzah on the door. The mezuzah, for those who may not know, is posted on the, on the doorway of Jewish homes, at least observant Jewish homes. And uh, um, it's, a, for lack of a better explanation, that blessing over the house. Um, turned a certain way because God is not necessarily straight up. He might be somewhere else. It's turned it's slanted a certain way. She saw the mezuzah and she took off down the driveway. And I called, Papa, this woman came. She looks like Cece, but she's leaving. My father went out the door and he caught her at the head of the driveway and he said, you're at the right house. You're at the right house. Please come in. So she came in, frightened. She saw the mezuzah at the doorway, and she said, you don't wish me in your home. You don't wish me in your home. Couldn't understand why. She seemed like such a wonderful lady. My father said, why? My people did such terrible things to your people. My father said, please come in and sit with us. And I'll never forget, I didn't know what he was talking about. I was frightened. What did she do? Who did she do it to? And she sat, and they drank a cup of tea. And my grandmother was there. My grandmother had lost some people in the Holocaust. And I didn't know that my grandmother spoke German. I didn't know that as a child. And they spoke. And as it turned out, this woman had come to this country before had a son who was a Nazi soldier and who after the war she had not had any contact with. And this was already 1956, so it had already been 11 years since she had had any contact with her son. He had been a, uh, an advocate, uh, not highly ranked, but strong in his views. His parents were so ashamed. That dear woman took care of us for nine and a half months. And she was a beautiful, beautiful woman. A grandmother.
talk about it in